Hello, my name is Cora Loomis. I'm a registered dietitian, and today I'm going to be talking to you about eating disorders. Learn more to better understand is the title of the conference. First off, I'd like to present to you a little bit more about Achimage Estri. Um, their mission is promoting self-acceptance and body diversity while supporting people challenged by these issues, target population, anyone living in a body, and the main objectives are to promote self-acceptance, raise awareness about body diversity, promote critical thinking through outreach and prevention actions, as well as actively contribute to the transformation of social standards. Achimage Estri has several services, including educational workshops. Um, two free workshops per year are offered online or virtually, on-site or virtually, <laughs> um, to organizations who are members of Achimage Estri. There's also awareness campaigns and outreach tools that are done online via the website and the social media. Conferences and events, there's always several conferences and events offered um, throughout the year. Uh, these are free for the members of Achimage Estri. And there are support groups. So there's a few support groups. There's one on intuitive eating that lasts five weeks and is animated by me, offered once a year. Uh, there's also art therapy groups in French, 12-week uh, long art therapy groups, more on the subjects of eating disorders and body image. There's also awareness and information booths that are offered, um, especially in secondary schools uh, for anyone who's interested. Um, I can add here that Achimage Estri believes in the group approach. The organization does not offer any individual services or consultations, but they a are able to redirect you to someone uh, in case you would like that. For today, I have three main objectives in this presentation. So the first one being um, to explain the multifactorial nature of eating disorders. I hope to help demystify eating disorders. So it'll help you learn what's true and what's not true maybe in terms of what you believe or how you perceive eating disorders, all based, um, science-based evidence-based. Uh, also, uh, we're going to finish up with the identification of attitudes that better support a person living with an eating disorder. So kind of how you can help if you're a support person. But before we dive in, uh, just a little invitation to use your critical thinking. So what is critical thinking? It's being able to doubt. It's being able to question. <laughs> it's being able to uh, analyze and evaluate, you know, the factual evidence in order to form a judgment on a subject. So basically an invitation to kind of put on the curiosity hat and um, really take the next uh, minutes that we have, a little under an hour, to be critical about what you're hearing and about what you maybe already believe and uh, definitely stay open. So we're going to start talking about body image. You'll understand why, but it's really important to talk about body image before we talk about what eating disorders are because they're so linked. Um, so body image is essentially a person's perception of their body and what they believe others perceive of their body. It's something that is easily distorted by our thoughts, emotions, feelings, and beliefs, and it's also really normal that it fluctuates. So body image is something that's very fluid because it's influenced by so many different things. Uh, some days we can feel great about our bodies. Some days we can feel really not great about our bodies. Some days we care a lot less. Um, so that's really normal that it fluctuates. It's something that's very, very fluid. I love to present body image as a tree, the <laughs> tree analogy. Uh, essentially, there's three sections, so the roots, the trunk, and the leaves, the roots being the lived experience. Um, so anything that um, has to do or is connected with the body, for example, the family dynamics, comments, uh, traumas, positive experience as well can be part of the roots. The trunk uh, is the cognitive aspect, so that's where thoughts and beliefs um, and values will show up hugely informed by the experience 
uh, so the root section. And then the trunk in turn feeds the leaves, which are the behaviors. And some examples of behaviors that are related to body image are the choice of clothes, um, the type of clothes, for example, the behaviors on social networks, uh, who we engage with on social networks, which friends we hang out with in person as well. Um, things like body checking, so looking at yourself in the mirror, touching your body, weighing yourself, those are things that uh, show up in the behavior aspect of body image. Um, it's also important to understand that body image is influenced by many things, so many, um, many aspects that contribute to the development of a body image, whether it's going to be positive or negative. First off, social learning, so the cultural socialization that dictates, dictates beauty norms from an early age. Um, that essentially means that we are aware from a very young age what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in terms of beauty standards, what is going to be desirable or not desirable interpersonal experiences, any um, anything that has to do with comments or interactions about our body. That can be from family, peers, community, on social media as well. Uh, next up, our real image will definitely have an impact on the development of body image. So that's the physical attributes that uh, are compared to beauty standards by ourselves or by others. Um, so obviously that is as a factor that impacts the development of body image. Positive self-esteem, no, so that one positively impacts body image in the sense that if you have a positive self-esteem, it's a self-esteem or, or you value yourself through a variety of things. So it's not just your appearance, but you're also able to identify your strengths when it comes to skill sets, uh, whether they be physical, like manual skills, or whether they be more psychological skills, personality, uh, being able to see yourself as a whole person and not just a body or an image or your appearance. Uh, there's also body image investment, so how much importance we put on body image, often something that's learned, again, the social aspects of that. Uh, personality affects um, body image as well, so people who tend to be more perfectionists, um, who really have a big need for approval, a uh, tendency to adhere to the female stereotypes, these are things that usually contribute to a more negative body image. Body competency. Uh, is the knowledge of your body's abilities, confidence in your abilities, and knowledge of your limits. So being just really connected to what your body can do instead of just what your body looks like. Uh, and also body awareness or interoception. <laughs> it's a fancy word for saying, um, for talking about the ability to listen to your body's cues. So the connection to what your body is asking or what your body is saying. So this can be I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm tired, I'm cold, I'm sad. Uh, when we talk about interoception, feelings are also part of that because they happen in our body. So again, body image is something that is super fluid and, um, you know, is developed through many, many different aspects. What are eating disorders? Eating disorders are complex and multifactorial issues characterized by rigid beliefs and attitudes, as well as extreme behaviors regarding food, body, and weight. Um, there are certain eating disorders that are identified in the DSM-5. Um, so anorexia nervosa, one of them, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder. And then there's the OSFEDs, so the other specified feeding or eating disorders that include muscle dysmorphic disorder, <laughs> disorder um, orthorexia, and body dysmorphic disorder. <laughs> so I'm going to explain the characteristics of each of these types of eating disorders. But one thing that I want to just say right off the bat is they are all complex. They are all considered biopsychosocial. Uh, um, disorders, so, you know, not just being one thing or the other. We're going to talk about the predisposing factors from the, that point of view. Uh, eating disorders act as emotional anesthesia. So there's definitely uh, really good reasons for these behaviors to show up, for these disorders to show up. 
um, and they generally take precedence over all other areas in the person's life and really reduce the quality of life of the individual. So first off, anorexia, it's probably uh, the eating disorder that you've heard most about. Um, the official term is anorexia nervosa. And it's characterized mostly by a distorted perception of one's own body size, image, and shape. So a person will look at themselves and not see what others see or not see what's actually reflected in the mirror. Uh, generally, um, this means that the person will see themselves being much bigger um, than they actually are. There's an excessive influence of body weight or shape on self-esteem. Um, so we were talking about body image and positive self-esteem. The importance put on body image and body weight and body appearance is really, really, really huge. There's a phobia or a, an extreme fear um, of weight gain and uh, generally a resistance to the idea of maintaining what is considered to be a normal weight. Um, that said, I've definitely seen cases of anorexia nervosa in people who are at a normal weight or even who are at a higher weight. Um, but the behaviors and the beliefs and the fear are there and it's definitely um, problematic even if they're not, you know, at a lower weight or refusing to be at a normal weight. Uh, everybody's normal weight is actually quite different. <laughs> Uh, anorexia nervosa is always accompanied with obsession, obsession about food, um, obsession about weight, and there's a lot, a lot, a lot of control. So control over food intake in order to control the weight. So behaviors such as uh, deprivation or restriction, calorie counting, sometimes um, also some other behaviors like the use of laxatives, appetite suppressants, induced vomiting, and that's because there's two types of anorexia nervosa. There's uh, the restrictive type where it's just restriction, um, and there's also the binge eating purging type where there's restriction accompanied with binge eating, and then some compensatory uh, behaviors. We're going to talk about the definition of binge eating in just a second. Um, in terms of the control and kind of the characteristics of anorexia, there's also really a lot of um, you know, personal identity wrapped up in these behaviors of control. Next up, bulimia nervo nervosa. So bulimia nervosa is, or bulimia, is something that um, is characterized by episodes of binge eating. What is binge eating? So binge eating, also called compulsive eating, is characterized by consuming large quantities of food uh, accompanied by a feeling of loss of control and generally the episode is followed up by feelings of shame, guilt and disgust towards oneself. It's really hard to um, quantify what a large <laughs> quantity of food is but generally speaking it's going to be a larger quantity than what would normally be consumed in a short period of time. That said, uh, all experiences of binge eating are very, very personal, and um, as a dietitian, I don't necessarily care what the quantity is. It's more about the experience of loss of control and the feelings of shame and guilt that, um, that show up after. In terms of what triggers an episode of binge eating, it's really important to recognize that there's basically do fa two factors. First one is restriction. So there's almost always restriction, even if bulimia is uh, characterized by the binge eating, there's going to be restriction, um, whether it's physical restriction, caloric restriction, or whether it's cognitive restriction. So sometimes it's not eating enough food, but also sometimes it's just believing that what you're eating, you shouldn't be eating, or um, valuing your portion as being too much um, or thinking you're a bad person for eating a certain type of food or a certain quantity of food. And so that restriction is one of the triggers for binge eating episodes. Um, but there's also almost always an emotional component. So we talk about eating disorders as being emotional anesthesia. Um, and often when big hard emotions are present, binge eating can come in and help soothe uh, those experiences. So binge eating is part of bulimia. Um, generally, there's going to be compensatory behaviors, 
uh, different ones. Um, so sometimes it's vomiting, use of laxatives and or diuretics. It can be fasting, so the restriction can be part of the compensatory behavior. Uh, excessive physical exercise, um, and there's, you know, lots of different behaviors that can be used to compensate. Uh, again, there's always going to be feelings of shame, guilt, disgust following the loss of control. And there's also a huge preoccupation when it comes to weight and body. So a lot of obsession on those two fronts. Next up, binge eating disorder. Uh, it's more recently recognized in the DSM. And binge eating disorder is essentially um, episodes of binge eating, but without the compensatory behaviors. So um, it's extremely uncomfortable. Uh, binge eating for anyone is an extremely uncomfortable experience. But with binge eating disorder, we don't see the compensatory behaviors. And so there's even more shame, guilt, disgust, self-hatred um, showing up. Generally, people affected by binge eating disorder are at a higher weight, but not always. We really can't see if someone has an eating disorder. It's uh, much, much more complex than that. Um, but what is important here is recognizing that there's more um, stigmatization around uh, binge eating disorder because of generally uh, higher weight. Also interesting to know, binge eating disorder is the one that affects men the most. So 40% of people diagnosed with binge eating disorder are men. Uh, the, in terms of the other specified feeding and eating disorders, we've got the muscle dysmorphic disorder, sometimes called bigorexia or the Adonis complex. Um, and it's really accompanied with body image distortion. So someone with uh, muscle dysmorphic disorio, disorder will perceive themselves as not strong enough, like they're never, they're never going to be bulky enough, they're never going to be strong enough because they don't see themselves um, realistically. There's a lot of body dissatisfaction <laughs> that shows up. Uh, there's a lot of body shame because uh, the person identifies their body as being n too small or lacking muscle mass. Um, what shows up in terms of behaviors are obsessive behaviors regarding food intake and the increase of their muscle mass. Um, sometimes there's even use of medications or bodybuilding products and steroids. There's generally an excessive exercise regime, so many hours a day spent um, working out uh, or, you know, working on muscle mass. And it's not reserved to, obviously, this can show up in anyone, but um, there's definitely more presence of this disorder in people who are in bodybuilding in high performance sports environments where muscle mass <laughs> and kind of the, the, the look of the body is um, important or is highly valued. You can touch both men and women in these environments. And the other uh, type of eating disorder, again, it's not really recognized yet by the DSM, but it's called orthorexia. Um, so orthorexia, in terms of the name, kind of sounds like anorexia, but it's different. So orthorexia, ortho being orthodox or like perfect, um, it basically means eating perfectly. So it's when there's an obsessive and rigid control over the quality of the food, a lot of emphasis put on, you know, is it healthy enough? Is it pure enough? Um, the, the diet becomes more and more strict. A lot of foods get rejected. Um, and the person can only eat or will only tolerate eating foods that they consider to be healthy. A lot of anxiety, a lot of compulsive checking of food labels. Often uh, there's um, social isolation that happens because it's too challenging to go out to eat and not have control over the quality of the food. Um, so a lot of rigidity that shows up that really affects the quality of life of the person and a lot of distress and anxiety. Uh, that accompany that because the person, you know, doesn't always have access to the foods that they consider healthy and good. Um, body image or weight issues are not always present, but of course they can be uh, because we live in a society that um, generally <laughs> leads us to be quite concerned about body image. When we talk about eating disorders, it's really interesting to look at it on a continuum. So from body insatisfaction or body dissatisfaction, 
um, all the way to the development of eating disorders. Uh, it's, it's cool to look at it on a continuum just to underline the fact that eating disorders don't show up overnight. They don't develop overnight. Uh, generally, there's kind of like precursor signs that show up, um, you know, with the body dissatisfaction, weight and food concerns, first diet, etc. And so it's something that develops over time and being able to identify kind of where a person is situated on the continuum can be really helpful uh, for the intervention and even for oneself. And honestly, everyone is situated somewhere on the continuum. Um, in our society, it's incredibly difficult to be 100% 100 satis satisfied with your body. So body dissatis dissatisfaction definitely shows up. And I mean, what does that mean? It just means wishing to have a different body than the one you have. Wishing your body could be different. Uh, weight and food concerns as we move uh, along this, the continuum uh, can usually just mean, you know, like thinking about the quality of food, maybe starting a first diet or just, you know, watching what you eat, being careful. Uh, next up, restriction and, and exercise. Um, so kind of when it starts becoming a bigger piece of, of the person's life. Uh, it means, you know, using restriction and exercise to lose weight or avoid gaining weight. Um, it can be restriction of certain food categories, certain food types. It can be like restriction of actual amounts of food as well. And the physical exercise is all focused around uh, losing weight. From there, we move to chronic dieting. So it's when the diets or the restriction become... Uh, more and more regular. So repeated diets that often um, are sometimes the term that we use is like yo-yo dieting. Um, so you know going on, going off, going on, going off a diet, uh, which is really normal by the way. No one can maintain a diet long term. Um, and it's normal to want to restart a diet because we're taught that that's the way we uh, can control our body and our weight. Chronic dieting can lead to dysfunctional eating habits. Um, so that in this part, we're talking about like strict diets, like really, really severe restriction, um, episodes of binge eating, sometimes calorie counting can become really excessive. Uh, generally, the goal of uh, like the daily allowance of calories is really low. And so it's not necessarily an eating disorder, but it definitely um, lines up with dysfunctional eating habits starting to affect the quality of life. And then eating disorders, um, so a lot of obsession, a lot of, you know, concern about weight, fear around weight gain, uh, body image, food, etc. Another uh, really great way of, you know, kind of presenting or talking about eating disorders is the iceberg <laughs> analogy. Um, so what we want to say here is that the tip of the iceberg is, and I mean in the picture it's not super clear, but the tip of the iceberg is really the behaviors that we can see. Uh, so it's the part that's visible to others, it's, you know, potentially the restriction, body changes, um, behaviors such as using laxatives and stuff like that. Uh, the binge eating as well, but the part that's underneath the water is really the biggest part and the most important part because the underwater part is the interactions between, you know, all of the different factors that lead to the development of an eating disorder. So we're going to talk about uh, those factors in just a minute. But it really is the largest part and it's the part that's hidden, not just to people around a person living with an eating disorder, but also to the person who is living with an eating disorder. Most of the time, um, it's really difficult to access all of those different psychological and emotional factors. It's not, um, it's not the reflex. We tend to focus on the behaviors that we can see and forget to really dive into what's underneath the surface. Again, uh, eating disorders are a coping mechanism. Uh, they really help people separate themselves from the, the difficult stuff that's underneath the surface. Uh, the iceberg is a really great tool to use um, when working through eating disorders and better understanding eating disorders because it helps us to get at the roots, the reasons um, that are underneath the surface. And that, in turn, helps develop tools um, that the person really needs in order to um, move into a place of recovery and uh, not have so many debilitating 
uh, eating disorder behaviors in their lives. So now that we have a better understanding of what eating disorders are, let's explore what's underneath the surface, the why. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to explore predisposing factors and also precipitating factors. First off, the predisposing factors, what puts a person at risk for developing an eating disorder. Three different categories. First one is social. So some of the social factors are the social pressure that we live with in our diet culture. So images and messages conveyed by society and the media, uh, for example, unrealistic beauty models, lack of diversity, the gender stereotypes that show up as well. Uh, there's also the peers, family, and friends when we look at the social aspect. So it can be comments that we've directly received um, towards our body or our image or our weight. It can be comments that aren't directed towards us but that we hear people say about themselves or about others. That's hugely going to affect how we perceive what's okay and what's not okay in terms of body size and shape. Especially when it comes to family, there's a lot of transmission of um, beliefs and values in terms of what is socially acceptable and not in terms of body size. Um, and the family dynamics are an important predisposing factor and or protective factor. Uh, so <clears throat> in terms of the predisposing, what puts a person at risk, it would be a dysfunctional or overprotective family, a family in which there are already eating disorders, so a member of the family is living with an eating disorder, a uh, family who's really focused on bodies <laughs> and weight, so body uh, weight obsession. Um, another thing is low recognition of emotions in the family. So if emotions are a bad thing, we're not able to express our emotions. Uh, that can uh, put a person at risk of developing an eating disorder. That said, <laughs> family factors may play a role in the development and perpetuation of an eating disorder, but they are by no means the sole reason or the cause of the development of an eating disorder. Super important to recognize also that in the recovery process, families are so, so, so important. Um, so we're not trying to blame families, we're just recognizing that yes, family dynamics can have an impact. Uh, diets in terms of social uh, components or factors. Uh, so the omnipresence of diet culture and the emphasis on diet and exercise as a way to lose weight normalizes dieting and uh, that in and of itself can be um, a risk factor. The thin equals healthy <laughs> association um, in our current society where diet culture is omnipresent, being thin is definitely associated with beauty, health, success, uh, popularity, self-control, status, like a lot of great things associated with thinness, whereas larger bodies are associated with laziness, neglect, stupidity, um, being mean, lack of self-control, lots of, lots of really unfortunate prejudices and, and beliefs there. These messages are reinforced by public health statements and a whole pile of other stuff. We're going to talk about it in a minute. There's also psychological predisposing factors. So low self-esteem or negative self-image. We touched on that when we talked about body image. So we know that um, putting a lot of emphasis on just your body appearance or not being able to recognize the multitude of things that make you an interesting and worthy person uh, definitely is a risk factor. Uh, difficulty in forming an identity as well. So it's if, if a person doesn't have a solid identity, a solid grasp on who they are, um, it's really easy to have a big desire to please in order to fit in, um, and a desire to conform rather than to assert oneself. And in some cases, the eating disorder even becomes the identity of the person. So, you know, belief that the eating disorder is the only element that makes them acceptable or lovable or, you know, okay. Uh, in the psychological factors, there's also hypersensitivity. Um, and I'm really glad that we are able to recognize that more and more. So someone who's hypersensitive, um, I identify as someone who's hypersensitive. It just means that we feel things very, very deeply. And in feeling things very, very deeply, like the great stuff can be really fun, but the hard stuff can be really, really rough. And it means that, you know, emotions can be overwhelming. And um, oftentimes we don't want to feel them because they're just overwhelming. And so sometimes the eating disorder comes in as a coping mechanism. <clears throat> 
hypersensitivity comes with a lot of great components as well, um, but it definitely can be a risk factor. Uh, body transformation and how we perceive those body transformation or body changes. Um, so bodies change over a lifetime absolutely normal. <laughs> we grow, uh, we age, um, different life events happen that cause bodies to change. Uh, but unfortunately, our society doesn't want to recognize that that's normal. And there's a lot of pression, pressure to um, stay kind of the same or to fit within one uh, ideal um, of, of a body. And so those changes and how we perceive them can be really difficult and can be predisposing factors. The psychological health of, of an individual, like kind of overall, so if there are other psychological uh, health problems present, such as anxiety, uh, depression, OCD, any types of uh, psychological uh, challenges. Um, the strengths of the person also uh, need to be mentioned here as a protective factor. So the ability um, to communicate, self-assertion, um, resilience, creativity, introspection, or able to reflect, ability to reflect on what's going on. Um, and of course, the personality also has an impact, uh, as I mentioned when we we're talking about body image. The last factor is a biological. And so we do recognize that eating disorders have a biological genetic um, component to it. So family history, uh, you know, part of the, the genetics. So family history of psychological uh, health problems like anxiety, depression, also um, eating disorders in the family because we know that heredity is a factor which may increase the risk of developing an eating disorder. Uh, through the transmission of temperamental traits or vulnerability to disturbances. So definitely um, something to be aware of. And just to make sure that it's really, really clear, <laughs> we're talking about kind of the social aspects, the cultural context, the diet culture piece. Um, I just want to add, um, add some thoughts to the cultural context of um, eating disorders. So we are in a society that's steeped in diet culture. Uh, our society values, <laughs> values healthy eating, values thinness. Um, there's so much social pressure to eat well, to eat healthy, uh, to choose, you know, good foods, to make the right choices. There's an overabundance of messages from a bajillion different sources, whether it's public health, cooking shows, books and magazines, internet and social networks. Uh, different organi organizations as well um, that are trying to, you know, promote healthy living, but sometimes the messages can get a little bit uh, skewed. Um, obviously, health professionals such as dietitians can, you know, continue to perpetuate the idea that thinner is better, that we really need to eat healthy. And even things like grocery stores, the way the marketing happens, <laughs> reinforces all of that. So basically, there's a lot of messaging. It can be contradictory, but it basically reinforces that thin is better uh, and that we need to eat healthy. And speaking of thin is better and the stigmatization of larger bodies as well, um, studies have been done showing kind of the associations that people make um, when it comes to thin bodies versus larger bodies. So there's a lot of, you know, preconceived ideas about what a thin body means, including uh, thin bodies are a sign that the person is in control. A lot of self-control, a lot of moderation, um, that the person is, you know, more able to perform in life in general, uh, that the person is more interesting from a sexual or from a uh, relational like standpoint, so like seduction, we definitely associate with thinness, um, health. Uh, there's also, strangely enough, a lot of pressure, like there's this perfect thinness <laughs> that has to be attained, and if there's the person is too thin, then it's too much, but like it's a really, really um, fairly limited idea of what's acceptable. Um, control, success, you know, wealth, social status, all of these things are associated with thinness. Um, and in terms of larger bodies, um, fat people carry on their shoulders the responsibility of their body. Um, weight stigma, fat phobia, these are terms that are really important, I think, to wrap our head around and to understand that it's real that people living in larger bodies live uh, 
with a lot of weight stigma on a daily basis. Um, studies show that people in larger bodies are perceived as lacking motivation, as making bad choices in terms of their life and their lifestyle habits, uh, that they're unintelligent, that they're negligent, that they're lacking willpower and self-control, and that they're morally failing. These are all really intense uh, you know, perceptions and judgments, and I just want to take a second to say even though that is what we've, you know, what we see the society as perceiving. These are not truths. <laughs> uh, just as someone in a thinner body is not necessarily all of the things that were that I just mentioned. Um, so yeah, there's lots and lots of perceptions and stigmatization, and we also know that the weight stigma. Um, is associated with a lot of negative impacts, including psychological stress, depression, anxiety, it has an impact on eating habits such as increased caloric intake, inappropriate eating behaviors, binge eating episodes, uh, less physical activity, social isolation, a lot of inequities and prejudices on the front of like employment, education, interpersonal relations. Um, so we know, for example, that um, people in larger bodies are less likely to get promoted. They're even less likely to get hired. Um, people in larger bodies are less likely to graduate high school. Like there's, there's so many problematic statistics out there when it comes to weight stigma uh, that really creates just, you know, even more inequity and prejudices. Um, and again, it's just, it's just everywhere. It's just the diet culture and it's, and it's really rough to be in this cultural context and um, definitely doesn't help when we talk about, you know, the predisposing factors of developing an eating disorder. Next up, the precipitating factors. So we know that there are predisposing factors that put a person at risk, but what makes the eating disorder actually show up, <laughs> actually develop? Uh, generally speaking, it's going to be big life events. So uh, some of some examples are losses, separations, bereavements, grief, anything that, you know, it's just hard to go through. Failures, whether they're like, you know, professional failures or um, relationship failures, trauma, uh, any types of trauma, accidents, sexual assault, uh, any experience that is lived um, as trauma for that individual. Uh, pregnancy uh, is actually a really big one simply because um, pregnant bodies change in a significant way and it can be really challenging um, to, you know, wrap your head around and it can be really difficult to accept that uh, bodies change, that weight is gained, uh, even though it's a super, super normal part of the process. Uh, promotions um, are actually one of the precipitating factors and that's because it comes with a lot of extra stress, a lot of extra pressure and that can be really hard to manage. And speaking of extra stress and pressure, any various strains and stress and pressure is going to be uh, part of uh, the precipitating factors. So whether that's related to work, school, uh, life cycles, for example, like a wedding, <laughs> marriage, uh, the arrival of a child, retirement. These are things that come with, you know, a lot of expectations around them and that can be hard to manage, hard, hard to navigate. Uh, any significant transition or change, any destabilizing situation is going to be a precipitating factor. The, um, the thing that really usually tips kind of the, the scale in terms of um, developing an eating disorder is these big life events combined with restriction, combined with dieting. And dieting is more often than not one of the things that people choose to do in order to deal with uh, some of these big changes. And so uh, caloric restriction, uh, studies have shown that in people with genetic predispositions to eating disorders, an eating disorder most often results from dieting. It's going to be like the first step. And as little as a moderate three-week diet impairs brain function and reduces the presence of the naturally occurring chemicals with which our body controls mood, thinking, and fullness. And so it puts the person even more at risk of, um, you know, developing more and more severe behaviors. 
Uh, so when something, when the predisposing factors, the risks are there and then something big happens, you know, usually combined with some form of restriction or diet, an eating disorder shows up. Um, and it's just so important to underline again that the eating disorder's role is uh, like a buoy, like a lifeline, like something that can really, really save the person. So um, generally we talk about eating disorders as something that's enabling a person to emotionally survive, even if long term this survival or coping mechanism causes more suffering. Uh, eating disorders act as an emotional anesthesia, whether it be the restriction piece more in, in anorexia or whether it be the numbing piece when we talk about bulimia or binge eating disorder. Um, and it really is a way also, especially in big life changes and events, it's a way to, to take back control, to feel like you're in control of something when there's too many things that all of a sudden are out of control and you don't have maybe the capacity to, you know, adapt to change or the self-esteem that will help you get through those changes. The recovery process. So let's talk about what that looks like and what to expect from the recovery process. Hélène L. Provencher, um, this is a citation, says, the ultimate goal of the recovery experience is not necessarily to regain health in terms of complete remission, so absence of symptoms, and return to pre-morbid functioning, but to find a new balance and definition of self in the present situation. So the recovery process is not necessarily taking the eating disorder, making it completely go away, but more about finding a new balance and finding quality of life within one's new reality. So the recovery process um, always includes, <laughs> includes relapses, crises and relapses. We're going to talk about those in a minute. Um, the person living with an eating disorder is definitely the expert and is the one who should be choosing what they need for recovery. Um, so it's very different for each person. Again, we're going to talk about kind of the support team and, and what to put in place in order to help the person in the recovery process. We like to recognize that it's a really unique process for each person. It looks really different for each person. Everyone has their own rhythm or their own um, kind of speed of recovery. Um, most of the time people want it to go quicker, <laughs> but it's really difficult uh, for that to happen. Uh, any improvement in a person's quality of life is considered a step in the direction of recovery. If you are a support person for someone living with an eating disorder, um, I really invite you to check yourself and not impose your own vision of what recovery should look like for that person. It's the person living with the eating disorder who gets to decide that. Everybody needs support in their recovery. Again, we're gonna talk about that in a second. And every person has the right to choose which type of support they need. The recovery process is always a long-term process. So accepting it as a long-term process can be really helpful from the get-go, understanding that if eating disorder behaviors have been around for years, chances are it'll take years for recovery, the recovery process to happen. Um, it's okay to, you know, find and accept one's pace, sometimes trying something out and realizing that, oh, that's too fast, or, you know, feeling impatient, that's okay too. Uh, it's okay to adjust the, um, the rhythm or the pace of the recovery. Um, again, about the quality of life, focusing on quality of life, focusing on improvements in quality of life is a super powerful tool in the recovery process because we see that as the quality of life improves, the eating disorder symptoms decrease. Um, and kind of the approach that Achimage uses and that I like to use too is um, setting realistic goals, really focusing on baby steps. So uh, one baby step at a time can really, you know, get a person very, very far. But being able to set realistic goals instead of like trying to take too much on at a time. It helps uh, to follow one's own needs and pace when you're doing, you know, baby steps. And a baby step for one person might look a little bit different than a baby step for the other person. And that's okay. 
but a few more words on relapses as part of the recovery process because it's 100% normal and expected and also can be really, really discouraging for the person who's going through a recovery. So we know that the process of recovery involves many changes in behaviors, attitudes, modes of reaction, like we're, we're you know, working on developing different ways of approaching difficult situations. And of course, it may lead to imbalance and relapse. Of course, it may lead to the person kind of wanting to fall back on the behaviors that have been comforting, that have been life-saving for them in the past. Relapses are often perceived as failures, uh, understandably so, but what I'd like to do is uh, invite everyone to see them as learning opportunities. Uh, so it's really a wonderful opportunity for learning, experimentation, implementing change, and getting curious about why the relapse happened um, is maybe where we could focus our energies. So some questions to ask. Uh, what does this relapse teach us? What message does it send us? What is going on when it happens? Or like what, you know, kind of triggered that relapse? Um, and is there an issue that needs working on? A new source of stress that is showing up? A more difficult time? Um, you know, a, a, a new life event that's, you know, been added to the melting pot of stuff that uh, kind of triggered the eating disorder in the first place? Uh, is there a lack of tools or resources? It can be an opportunity to identify, you know, okay, oh, well, let's, you know, work on this piece of what's found underneath the iceberg. The last topic I want to talk to you about today is how to help a person affected by an eating disorder. So I've got a few uh, points, a few pieces of advice that I'd like to offer. The first one is if you're supporting someone with an eating disorder, super important to ensure that they're in a safe place. So ensuring security, ensuring safety. How can you determine if there is an emergency? There are a few things to keep um, in mind. If you feel that a person is not safe, trust your gut, trust your instinct. Um, also, when a person demonstrates serious physical problems such as dizziness, fainting, difficult standing, disturbed vision, sometimes inability to like string a sentence together, chances are there's an emergency. When a person refuses to drink because they're at risk of dehydration, when a person is pregnant, when a person has type 1 diabetes or any other health issues, honestly. Uh, when a person demonstrates acute psychological distress such as psychosis or a panic attack chances are there's an emergency and when a person makes suicidal remarks so what to do if you um, determine that this person is not safe uh, first off assess your own limitations and abilities facing the situation so are you comfortable um, helping out if not you can always contact a support person a friend a relative a spouse a counselor anyone who might be the support person for that person. Um, you can, if you do feel comfortable, also accompany the person to the hospital, uh, as would the support person do, um, if they agree, of course. Um, you can also call 911. You can call uh, Je Vis, uh, which is the um, helpline for suicidal thoughts. Um, so making sure to act on the evaluation of, you know, it being an emergency or the person not being safe is very important. Next up, what you can do is learn more about eating disorders, understand what they're all about, um, being aware of the multifactor ma multifactorial nature of eating disorders, and I would like to argue that if you've made it this far in this talk, you definitely have a better understanding of what eating disorder disorders are, a uh, better awareness of, you know, the multifactorial aspects of it. Uh, Anib Quebec has a hotline that you can call. Um, the number is 1-800-630-0907. You can also do a little bit of inter internet search and find it very easily. So Anib Quebec, um, bilingual hotline available for anyone with questions, including support people. Very important next up to respect the person's own space. So each person recovers at their own pace um, and they need you know to be respected in that the person is the only one responsible for asking for help and choosing the kind of support they need it is not our job to impose anything on a person um, living with an eating disorder 
recognizing that relapses are part of the recovery process, so respecting also that that's part of the process, part of the pace, and that the person just always needs support. A lot, a lot of support through each and every step of the recovery process, especially if there's a refeeding process um, or a weight gain process. Those can be very, very, very confronting and difficult, and just being there for the person and respecting this speed, the pace at which they're able to go, uh, is a huge way to help. Listening is also an excellent way to help, to support. Um, listening sincerely and without judgment as much as is possible. Um, it's really the best support that you can offer someone suffering or living with an eating disorder. It's best um, to not to try to take charge or to give advice or propose, you know, like solutions, but just listen, just be there. Also being aware of one's own needs and boundaries as an individual supporting a person with an eating disorder. It's okay to have needs and boundaries. It's okay to not be able to be the only support person. It's okay to seek help and support when you need, uh, whether it be through friends or a, health, a professional. Uh, you can, you know, there's support groups that exist for people supporting people with eating disorders. Um, it's a great opportunity also to, you know, get really curious and get aware of your own attitudes and behaviors regarding food and body image um, so that you can, you know, maybe understand what's triggering about the situation or understand how your own relationship might, with your food and body might have an impact on the person's relationship. Uh, if you're a health professional, it's really important to recognize your own limitations as a person and also as a professional and stick with your, uh, like your capacities and your professional role so as not to, you know, cross over. For example, as a dietitian, um, I cannot play the role of a psychologist or a social worker and that's okay. That's why a team is generally a really great idea. You are your best resource when it comes to supporting someone with an eating disorder. Um, so how to kind of make sure you use your <laughs> yourself as your resource. Um, definitely some of the things that I can say is aiming discussions away from food and appearance. Um, the person living with an eating disorder is already very much so, you know, thinking about these things. We don't have to talk about them more. Um, it's more helpful to aim the discussions towards feelings, relationships, the psychological stuff that's underneath the surface in terms of the iceberg uh, analogy. Um, and definitely try and see the person, not the eating disorder. I oftentimes um, explain it as there's, you know, the, the healthy person's brain and then the eating disorder brain or the healthy person's voice and the eating disorder's voice and just you know remembering that this is a person this person is not their eating disorder they are still 100 percent themselves um, sometimes things are masked sometimes it gets tricky uh, but seeing the person as as themselves is a really great way um, to use you know your connection with that person Focusing on the person's strengths, um, so really, you know, bolstering their potential and their ability to recover, nurture and reinforce the positive behavior, behaviors, attitudes, beliefs, underlining the baby steps that they're taking, you know, celebrating those wins uh, can be really helpful. We want to empower the person. Again, coming back to the quality of life, uh, such an important com component. So really, you know, focus on, on improving quality of life, focus on creating contexts in which the person feels safe and happy and is exploring um, or living, you know, what is important to them. Encouraging experimentation is another really wonderful way to support a person. And that means um, just kind of taking a, a, an approach where it's not a lifetime <laughs> agreement to, you know, try something new or try a new strategy. It's just, you know, testing out a new tra strategy for a certain amount of weeks or for a certain amount of months or even for a certain amount of days and seeing how they feel about that, seeing how it impacts their quality of life. Um, and it's important to try out different strategies. Not everyone reacts the same way to the same types of strategies, obviously. Uh, lastly, on this topic, uh, really important to strengthen the support network. Um, so the support network can look different for each person. 
uh, generally, you know, it's going to be a mix of family, friends, colleagues, support groups, professionals. It really is up to the person to determine, actually, the support team. And on that front, um, it's important that, yes, there are some professionals in that team, but that also there are just friends. <laughs> There's just, you know, people who can support um, the individual in not thinking about the eating disorder, not thinking about, you know, recovery, uh, just distraction and fun. <laughs> so on the professional point of view, generally speaking, we rec recommend that there's a doctor, uh, a, psycholo a psychologist and or a social worker um, and a dietitian, but that's not necessary. The individual is responsible for determining what type of team they want, what type of support they need. Really important to find people with whom... Um, you're comfortable. Um, if you are living with an eating disorder and you're looking for your team, trust your gut. You'll know who you feel comfortable with, who it clicks with. Um, and I mean, it might not be the classic team that I just defined. It might be an art therapist. Uh, it might be through support groups. It might be through like physiotherapy. Very, very much important that you trust um, kind of who you want on your team. In terms of psychotherapy, uh, just a, a little note there, it's not necessary for um, your psychologist to be educated or aware of eating disorders. However, it can be very helpful. But please, please, please don't let that stop you from, you know, trusting your gut and having a, a psychologist who's actually just a really good fit and can help you with all of the, the different stuff that's underneath the iceberg. Um, generally speaking, they can also, you know, continue to learn and grow on that front and get more continued education uh, and awareness training about eating disorders. Um, for sure it helps when they're already aware, but it's not a prerequisite. So, finishing up, um, eating disorders aren't all about food. I think I've made it abundantly clear that the behaviors, the food-related stuff's on the surface, and then there's just so much stuff underneath the surface. Um, it's not a food issue. Yes, it affects food, it affects the relationship with food, um, but it's not about food at the end of the day. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to Arimagestri. Um, the website and all of that info is on a slide in just a few seconds. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we go over kind of everything that we talked about today. Uh, so essentially, you know, like the key elements, <laughs> the things to remember is eating disorders are very much like icebergs. Behaviors up top, all of the important stuff <laughs> down below, and it's addressing the psychological, the social, the emotional factors that uh, will, will help someone move towards a place of recovery. Eating disorders serve a purpose. They have a role, and that is almost always a lifeline. Um, coping mechanism, definitely, um, definitely important to recognize that it doesn't just show up. There's good reasons for it. Uh, unfortunately, eventually, the life, this lifeline, the eating disorders, cause more suffering, um, and that's why the recovery process can be so tricky. Um, and when we talk about the recovery process, again, so important to recognize that it's long-term, it's unique, it's going to be different for everyone, and will always include relapses, and that's okay. Uh, EDs, or eating disorders, aren't all about food. Um, and it's so important to address the other stuff and not just the food component when we're supporting someone with an eating disorder. Baby steps are a wonderful approach, uh, building on you know one step in front of the other in order to move forward. Um, and it helps the person really move towards a place where the quality of life is improved. And lastly, you are your best resource in helping a person affected by an eating disorder. And again, as a support person, you should be aware of your own needs and boundaries. Always trust yourself. Always get support if you need to. Um, and trust that it's because of who you are <laughs> that you're a good support person for um, the individual living with an eating disorder. So like I said, if you have any questions or if you just want more information on the services that Archimagistry offers, the support groups, for example, 
Um, feel free to visit achimageestrie.com or <laughs> achimageestrie.com. Sorry, I'm so used to saying it in French. Um, there's also Facebook and Instagram uh, that is a way to connect with Achimageestrie. So I really hope that uh, this has been helpful, that you've learned a lot about what eating disorders are, the different types of eating disorders, the roles of eating disorders, and um, how you can help if you're a support person, and the importance of trusting yourself um, to create a team that works for you if you are someone living with an eating disorder. Thank you.